The 2016 legislative session has gotten off to a fast start, and State Senator Jill Shoup has a lot to say about some controversies that have gone on along the way. The Creve Corps Democrat joins us on another edition of Politically Speaking. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Uh, I think that is fair As to I say. say. Hands to kiss and babies to shake. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think my record speaks for itself. That's a really good question. Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in studio today in St. Louis is... Colleague Joe Manis. And back on Politically Speaking for the first time as a state senator, we have as our very special guest... Senator Jill Shoup, District 24. Yeah, the last time she was on, she was running for the office, but had not had it. And if I recall correctly, one of your goals for winning that race, which cost, you know, several million dollars, was so you could appear on the show for the third time. (laughs) Yes, and so I have, you know, reached that goal, marked that off the bucket list. Yeah, well, congratulations on reaching this this milestone. And just for our listeners, tell us a little bit about the, the 24th District, which cities are are encompassed within that district and w- sort of the borders, essentially. Right. So so the boundaries on the west side are essentially Woods Mill Road. On the east side, Highway 170. On the south side, Manchester Road. And these are rough. And on the north side, Highway 70. So there are 22 municipalities, including unincorporated St. Louis County. But uh, Creve Corps, where I live, Olivet, which was part of my House district, uh, is now still part of my Senate district. Ledoux, Town and Country, going south all the way over to a little bit of Kirkwood. And then on the north side, we have, on the north side of where I live, Maryland Heights, St. Anne, Overland, all the way over to just a little tiny bit of Bridgeton. And a, a part of Chesterfield, too? Part of Chesterfield on the west side. You can't forget about the mighty fields of Chester. So it's it's been a fast start to the legislative session so far. I know that this week, actually maybe a couple of days ago, you introduced a bill with Representative Tracy McCreary involving uh, family medical leave. And it's an issue that I think everybody at this table has had to deal with personally, but even more Missourians have to struggle with it as well. Tell us a little bit about the issue what you're trying to do about it, and what it would entail. Right. Well, first of all, we call it earned family and medical leave because this is something that is, first of all, we believe it's necessary. Um, You know, when people have babies, we talk about wanting uh, parents, both mothers and fathers, to be able to bond with those children, whether they are newborns, whether they are foster children, whether they are adoptive children. We also know with so many people living longer, sometimes we have to take care of our parents or even our grandparents. And we need to be able to feel like all of us can take some time away from work and not feel like we have to choose between helping a loved one, bonding with a new child, or being able to pay our bills because we are uh, working and getting paid for our work. So we have looked at legislation um, through throughout the country, and we've talked to some experts in the area, and we put together what we think is a good piece of legislation for Missouri. We call it earned because you have to be working in a job in the state of Missouri for a year before you have access to this. We also did it in a way that doesn't hurt the employer. The employer is not required to put money into this fund that would be administered by the Department of Labor. Instead, the employee pays one quarter of 1% of his or her earnings into a fund, and they can earn up to six weeks of paid leave at some point in time if they can prove that they need it. So if they can demonstrate that they have someone they need to care for, if it's themselves. I mean, if, if they have a health situation where they need to take up to six weeks off a year, they can do that. And um, we think it's a great, a great opportunity to allow people to stay in their jobs, to allow employers to use their money if they choose, to bring in somebody temporarily to take the place of their valued employee that's needing to take off work for for a period of time. Now, um, what sort of reception have you gotten from the business community and, of course, from the Republican majority, which have huge majorities in both chambers? Right. So we just filed this bill uh, yesterday, on Thursday. We each filed it yesterday, and we, we called the press forward to let them know about it. I believe that everyone from Missouri Right to Life who's going to say, yes, we want you to bond with your children, to employers who are going to say, 
this provides me an opportunity to generously give my employees this time off without having to be stuck with the bill. Now, what we also believe is employers can use this as a great benefit opportunity to say, we will cover the cost for our employees. They don't have to pay for it. So if you come work for us, you'll get this benefit paid for. They don't have to do that. They're not required to do it. This does not depend upon them doing it. But it's a great way to bring really skilled and quality employees into your business. Have any other states tried something like this before? I know that this has been kind of an issue that's been tried federally, obviously, because there is a federal Family Medical Leave Act. But many but it's people, unpaid. Yeah, but yeah, many, yeah, it's many unpaid. people, I was just about to say, it's many people, including I'm, I'm sure people at this table, have found it to be very lacking because it's unpaid. And you know, the amount of time off people get is just not enough to bond with the child. So have any other states tried anything different from that? Well, some other states are doing this. And we sort of looked at legislation in other states, and you're going to ask me to name them, and I can't name them off the top of my head. I'm sure it was Guam, you know, <laughs> non-states well, I think or something California like that. has one that they're looking at and working on now. But there are some other states who have put this into place, and ours does not align perfectly with any other states. We really created what we think is the right version of this for the state of Missouri. And I really do think that if and when uh, this piece of legislation gets put into place, this is an economic development tool that I think people are going to work here if they know that should the need arise or should they be of childbearing age and want to have a a child, they're going to have the opportunity to be able to spend time away from their job for up to six weeks and still get paid for it. Now, uh, realistically, I mean, as you've mentioned off the air, I mean, there's only eight Democrats in the Missouri Senate right now, and this is out of a body of 34. And uh, and then in the the House, it's not much different. It's like 44. I yeah, 44 say. out of uh, 163 that should be there. Right, right, 163. So the point is, you guys are facing a really daunting task on almost anything. So is this something that that you're getting some feedback from some Republicans that they might be interested in it? Or is this something to at least start the discussion going? That's exactly what it's for. Is to, you know, I would love to see this move forward and get passed. Again, I, do, I think that we have really taken into account um, the objections that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle might have. So we will see what happens if this is able to be moved forward. Certainly it's starting to be talked about at the national level in terms of paid family and medical leave. In Missouri, again, this is earned family and medical leave that is paid for by employees. I think we will see what our colleagues have to say. And if this gets the conversation started this year, I think it's terrific. Well, I think it, like many other issues that are going to the legislature in 2016, one big driver in 2017 could be who the governor is and how much pressure they want to embrace an issue like this. For example, if Attorney General Coster becomes governor, he may try to use his renowned legislative skills that he learned in the Missouri Senate to maybe make this a priority. If one of the four Republicans get in, maybe they embrace it as a Nixon goes to China moment. Who knows? It's hard to say, but I think that could be a factor to getting this off the ground eventually. Well, and I do think eventually it could become a real Democratic priority, just as you, as you stated. You know, I don't know if you're familiar, and you and I have not talked about this, but this year the Democrats, both the Senate Democrats, the House Democrats, and Attorney General Coster have joined together to put forward uh, eight bills that are really the Democratic platform and priorities and that pretty much say if we were governing, this is what the state would be focused on. So, Do you want to go through them, like, really quick? I, I will list them out really quickly. Okay. Um, this uh, It includes a lobbyist gift ban, equal pay for equal work, minimum wage to $10.10 an hour, uh, fully funding the Education Foundation formula, Certainly the expansion of Medicaid, uh, farm to table, saying that we want to make sure that our farmers' agricultural products are reaching all of our Missouri institutions, Uh, the uh, body cameras for police departments, and uh, passing the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act. So those are the eight priorities that we have agreed upon as Democrats throughout the state and that we believe should move forward. Now, with your proposal... Uh, I, you may have mentioned this, but I just want to reemphasize for our listeners, 
roughly how much would it raise a year? Would you be able to fund requests immediately or would there be a lag time before? There is absolutely a lag time and that's a really important question. And that's the reason that we say that people have to work a year before uh, this goes into effect for them personally, but also the program, the collection of um, of the one quarter, one cent um, fee starts a year before the program is actually uh Able to provide and that, this would be leave. this would be all employees everywhere. All employees throughout the state, and of they can't opt out of it. There is no opting out. And again, if the employer chooses to make a payment in in on behalf of the employee, that's great, and that's a a wonderful benefit and opportunity. But that's not required. How much do you estimate this would raise a year? You know, um, I am sorry to tell you, I don't have that figure here with me. But based on what we've seen in other states, we believe that will get us enough to cover. That, for, that we will be bringing in enough money every year to cover the use of the fa- paid family leave. And if we find that we fall short, then what we're going to have to do is make an adjustment. So now we'll turn to another issue that would become relevant when these babies become college age, and that's the turmoil at the University of Missouri-Columbia. Um, there have been many events that have hit the four-campus system that have raised the hackles of some legislators. We had Senator David Pierce on last week who gave his perspective as the chairman of the Senate Education Committee. I'd be interested to hear your perspective about what's going on and why the legislature is so up in arms about what's going on there, essentially. Well, I think that um, some of the legislators' angst and is a little bit misguided. I think that... Um, you know, there's a big focus on Melissa Click. I think over 100 legislators joined with Senator Schaefer to send a letter to the university asking for her resignation. and Or, the, or dismissal. Or dismissal. Right. Thank you. And, you know, she, um, her actions in the midst of a, a very difficult moment were, you know, unexcusable. They were wrong. But well, was, and they also got caught up on social media, the video of her comments has has probably had a gazillion views yeah right but continue but i think it right exactly and but i think it's a a, a misplaced when over 100 legislators send in uh, a letter asking for her um, dismissal i think that what it does is it it removes our sight from the real concern on campus about whether um, students of color whether minority students are being treated in the same way as their majority white counterparts and Concerned Student 1950, I think, is a movement that we need to start paying attention to. And we need to ask the university, what are you going to put in place? What are you going to do to make sure that all students who attend that university actually get the quality education that they deserve, that they came there for, and uh, that they are not, that they don't feel discriminated or left out of either the process or opportunities there. Now, now um, as uh, S- Senator Pierce had mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of angst among the General Assembly about everything that's been going on at Mizzou with the protests. And not all of that angst, uh, the, the click focus is just one example of it, is, is addressing the uh, racial tensions that, that are on campus. From your perspective in Jeff City, what what are you hearing? I mean, is it, is it the fact that, it, there, that there's been any sort of demonstrations at all? Um, is there, is this a resurrection of, I mean, many conservatives have long contended that universities, particularly um, public universities are too liberal and that they have too many liberal professors and that, uh, they espouse a liberal ideology. And I've, I've heard from some that they say that, that some of that general conception from the get go is kind of coloring some of this. I'm interested in your perspective. Well, it's interesting to hear that um, conservatives are saying that at the same time we have racial minorities saying, look, we're not being treated the same way as everybody else. We're not being treated fairly. Um, This is, if that is indeed the case, this is certainly not a, a liberal agenda because I think progressive people or liberals would tend to want to ensure that minorities felt welcomed and well taken care of on campus. So I think that there is an interesting juxtaposition between uh, what's going on or what is perceived to be going on and what is perceived to be going on by the people who are on campus and who are there. I think that we've seen, um, based on a lot of issues going on around campus, including 
um, refer and follow privileges to Planned Parenthood that is part of this whole big story around things that are going on in at the university, things that the legislators is inserting the, itself into, and sort of the idea that um, there are headlines to be had around these things. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really problematic. Uh, I think the legislator needs to do what it can to support um, our wonderful university system. And again, when we know that enrollment is going down, particularly among African Americans, maybe we need to take a look at how our policies on campus, and when I say we need to take a look, the university needs to take a look at how its policies on campus are contributing to the idea that African Americans are not being treated fairly. So one of the reasons why I think this intersects with the legislature, and this has not come to pass yet because the budget doesn't end up getting passed usually until May, is that some have feared that all these culmination of events will result in a cut in funding to the University of Missouri system. And one of the people that has a big say in that is Senate Appropriations Committee Chairman Kurt Schaefer. He's a Republican from Columbia. He's running for attorney general. When he ran for the state Senate in 2008, one of his big campaign planks was the fact that he thought the incumbent Senator Chuck Graham was ineffective at fighting for the university. And so I asked him about whether the fact that the university is in his district and he made that type of promise was going to have any influence on whether the budget cuts actually come to fruition. Here's what he had to say about that. I've been very supportive. I'm an alum. No one is more supportive of the university than me. But as I told a group uh, that I addressed the other day in Columbia, there's a difference between being a supporter and being an enabler. And while I am a supporter, I think there are many in the General Assembly who believe, like me, whether it's the University of Missouri or social services or the Department of Revenue, we're not going to be enablers of a lack of transparency and accountability. And so that's why I think it's incumbent on the university to show that they are being efficient and wise with the money they're getting from the state of Missouri. What do you make of what the senator had to say there, given that he has a lot of power over the university system's budget? Well, I think it's I think it's very concerning. And I think, you know, it's it's a little bit unclear from that quote to me whether he was talking about issues of refer and follow privileges uh, that he, in my view, bullied the university uh, into taking away from um from the doctor who works for Planned Parenthood. In Columbia, just so our In listeners Columbia, know. yes, thank you. And, um, you know, he defines himself as, you know, saying that nobody's been more supportive of the university than he has. I, I don't think that's the case. I think he's used his position as appropriations chair in the Senate to bully the university into behaving the way he thinks is appropriate. So, um, and I don't think that his focus is on making sure that kids who feel like they are being disenfranchised because they are African American, I don't think that's where his focus lies. If that's where it was, I would say I would applaud his efforts and say, come on, university, we made we need to make sure that you're taking care of all of your students. I think he is combining his um, role as, as budget chair with the fact that he's running for statewide office and the fact that he has the power to form these committees like his so-called Sanctity of Life Committee, uh, and to pressure the university, whether overtly or um, more subtly, uh, into behaving in the ways that he thinks are appropriate as a now very conservative legislature legislator in the state of So Missouri. do you think that it will actually come to pass that the legislature may cut the university system's budget significantly. I know that there was an article in the Post-Dispatch about how they've cut an increase in funding to the four campus system out, but that's just in the House. The Senate may decide on something completely different. The end result may be different. What's kind of your, your take on that? Yeah. So let me, you know, remind you of a quote um, from Senator Richard, who is the president pro tem of the Senate, who said, if they're not going to pay attention, we'll get their attention and, par- and apparently we'll have to do it through the budget process. He talked about giving the University of Missouri a haircut. Um, I think, though, while we're talking tough, just yesterday when I um, listened to the press conference that the Republicans hold every Monday and Thursday after session, I think that they're backing off from some of that tough talk. I think that at the end of the day, they may have um, Senator Schaefer, the Senate Appropriations Chair, come riding in on his white horse and saying we're going to restore some money to the university because at the end of the day, what we know happens is these cuts hurt students. 
And I don't think that um, that either Senator Richard nor Senator Schaefer wants to be accountable for what may be an issue of hurting the ability of students to get the quality and access to higher education that they need. But students generally don't wield a lot of political pressure. I mean, I've been hearing that the business community and some of the others who are major funders of the uh, private funding at Mizzou are starting to uh, put some pressure on Republican legislators to back off. Well, and I think that's absolutely true. And I'm, you know, and those are the people that need to do it because while the students don't yield any power, the harm that will be done will be done to the students. So I am, and I'll tell you, we say the students don't yield any power. Um, we saw we saw students come forward and say we want this, we want this to. Ha- we think there's racism on campus. We saw the the African American football team come forward and say this is a problem. Something needs to change. And Tim Wolf did resign. And whether you attribute that directly to them or not, um, the action that they requested happen did happen. Now I've been hearing that this happened just a few days ago. That there was uh, uh, the meeting the municipal league. Uh, was the Missouri Municipal League was gathering in uh, Jeff City and that some of the legislative leaders were addressing them and that at one point there was actual booing, allegedly, I want to emphasize, of of certain top Republican legislative leaders when some of this stuff came up. Um, And some of this has to do with splits over transportation, some of it splits over perceived urban-rural splits, all that. What are you hearing? I mean, as as one of the few Democrats in Jefferson City, and someone who used to be a member of the Creve Corps City Council, so someone who has municipal experience. Right. So I hear. I my understanding is that there are some things that people are very unhappy about, and they want to hear from our top elected officials, the um, the, the supermajority in both the House and the Senate, that their concerns and their issues are being addressed thoughtfully and heard. And you know if. As you and I both, know, all three of us know, um, Senator Richard is one who usually just states his opinion or states what's going to be done without talking about the rationale behind it. So what I heard from those meetings was he sort of said, this is how it's going to go and wasn't open to hearing how the things that he does impacts municipalities or impacts students. I'm glad that we you mentioned municipalities, Joe, because I think another reason the Municipal League is upset with the legislature is that the Senate has passed an update to what is widely known as Senate Bill 5, which is was a pretty substantial overhaul in municipal governance in St. Louis County and the rest of Missouri. And what Senator Eric Schmidt is trying to do this year is add non-traffic violations to mm-hmm. this, this pot of money that um, that basically is restricted by the state. Right now, cities in St. Louis County can't get any more than 12.5% of part of its budget from traffic fines. He would then say 12.5% of all fines, and for the rest of his state, it would be 20%. I think the other thing about the bill, which is raising alarm, is the fact that it cuts the amount of fines that can be levied for these these types of incidents, which I think is actually raising concern in Kansas City. Again, you're a former municipal official. I believe you actually voted against this bill. What are you kind of hearing about it from your, your cities and your city leaders? Right. Well, I was one of the very few people who voted against it. And and part of the reason was um, Senator Schmidt brought around um, people who were supposed to be sort of the poster child example, the poster examples of um, how mun- a municipality, the city of Pagedale, had utilized um, this ability to uh, their ordinances to issue tickets that these people felt like they were being discriminated against. And they came into my office and they sat down and talked to me and they were lovely people, don't get me wrong. But they told me about the overwhelming number of offenses that they had been accused of committing from, you know, paint missing on their house to barbecue grills out front to wrong colors of curtains and things that they had been issued tickets for and that the husband in this case had actually been put in jail. Um, And I was pretty much appalled that a city would be utilizing those kinds of things to take advantage of a community. But uh, not long after that, I got a series of emails from um, the city administrator of the city of Pagedale. They weren't directed to me. They were forwarded to me um, saying that this couple was not telling the truth. I don't know whether they were or not, but that the, the male who had been uh, incarcerated was incarcerated for public urination, that the female had never paid any kind of fine or fee, and there was nothing outstanding. Um, so 
I, it made me look a little bit further and say, well, I don't know where the truth lies here. So I contacted Jennifer Mann, who sent me, she had originally done the article about the city of She's Pagedale. She's a reporter for the Post-Dispatch, by right. the way. Right, right. And she sent me um, a lot of her background information, and I'm very grateful to her for that. Uh, but the information that she had used, that she read one way, I read a different way. And it is from... Uh, the Ward 1 Alder persons, Marla Smith and Faye Millett, I think is how you pronounce it. I think name. it's Faye Millett or Faye Millay or something like right. that. But continue. From, from the city of Pagedale, who um, put out their newsletter to the community. And I read this, and these are two women who are so proud of the community in which they live and who clearly want to do everything they can to help maintain the property values and really the, the viability and the strength of that community going forward. They have a list of item after item of ways to become involved in the community, activities that you can be in, um, the Red Bird Rookies Baseball Program, the Junior Devils Youth Association Football and Cheerleaders, um, the Pagedale Boxing Club, the Town Center, where it is and how to get there and what you can do there, on and on and on and on. And then they talk about, look, this summer, this spring and summer, we are going to make sure you know what some of the ordinances are that we have in place that we're going to be looking out for. We need you to obey the speed limit. We need you to we, we need you to finally follow these ordinances that we have so that we can keep our city in good stead. Now one of those ordinances was sagging pants that you can be ticketed for sagging pants for sagging pants. Now while you and I may not agree that that is a good reason for a municipality to give you a ticket, let's remember that these women, their intention is to keep their community safe, to keep the people living in a, a good and strong and active community. And what I believe is that the people in their community who may be getting tickets, let's remember this is different from somebody going through your community and getting a traffic ticket. This is somebody who lives there. This is somebody who has the opportunity, if they don't like what you're doing or what your message is or what the laws are on the books, they can vote you out of office. They have that opportunity because this is their community. So the fact that these people are all running unopposed says to me that, you know what, the community is not unhappy with the direction its elected officials and are trying to, to take. And just to kind it. of to give a little more context to that, I looked at the St. Louis County Election Board and specifically looked at Pagedale because Pagedale officials right. have been coming under fire. And all the incumbents are running unopposed. There is one seat that I think has three people, but I think it's an open seat. I don't know. I don't know how to read into that. Maybe it's a situation where people just don't have the time to run for municipal office. Maybe they're happy with the way things are going. But the fact remains that it goes to your point, which is a point that I've been questioning. If, if people are upset about this, there is a local solution to that, and that is to exert pressure on their local officials to change their ways. And by not running against them and by basically keeping the same people in office – there's no pressure for them to change, essentially. Well, and maybe they don't want them to change. I mean, I'm not uh, taking sides in any particular right. things, but right. I know Nor there's am a, I, but continue. But there's a lot of pressures in some of these communities, and this is all over the county, all over the state, but especially St. Louis County, in some of the um, areas where there's been economic distress. There's been pushes to try to make sure that homes are kept up, that lawns are... Uh, mode and those sorts of things because it does affect property values. It does affect how welcoming your community looks to other people who might be considering um, moving in. I know for for personal experience that the city of Florissant, for example, which is one of the largest and which is in North County, has always been very strong in enforcing those kinds of um, of ordinances to make sure that things are clean and that they look good. And whether one agrees or disagrees, whether they're going overboard or not the my point is is that you've got these pressures in a number of these communities and and these things that you read from pagedale is just a, an example of how some community leaders are really trying to improve their image but it also then collides with these efforts um to try to curb um what 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 some see as onerous fines or jail time Right. And I, and I also just want to point out that there are probably – Page Dale, I would say, would be a working class and, and in some cases has some a lot of poverty like many other North County cities. Right. But my assumption is that a lot of wealthier St. Louis County municipalities have very similar ordinances to this. I know that there was even instances where Ladue ran into 
problems because they had like anti-sign ordinances that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Right. And Paysville is not probably the only city that has ordinances aimed at keeping houses looking good, I would imagine. Right. Well, and I heard, I think I mentioned to you, I heard from the city of Frontenac that they were very much opposed to this change in uh, in this new bill from Eric Schmidt this year. And, um, you know, they said for some people t- to make a change in their house that may be making the neighborhood look bad because the grass is so high or, you know, what, whatever the situation may be, you know, $200 to some of the people who live in that community may not be enough to make them change their habit. Because and, it lowers the, t- the total amount to 300 to 200 because right now one of the things that Senate Bill 5 did, if I'm not mistaken, is traffic fines were capped at $300. If you put non-ordinance, non-traffic fine, or no, excuse me, if you put non-traffic ordinance violations into that mix, it would also cap that at $200 as well, which I think is, is raising some alarm everywhere throughout the state. Yeah, especially in the wealthier communities because of what, what you say, because they're like, well, we have to have higher fines or our residents won't necessarily care. Pay attention. And, you know, I think part of this is, you know, Senate Bill 5, you know, is going through a court challenge. I think let's see how some of these things play out before we continue to sort of preempt a local municipality's ability to do what it thinks is right for its citizens. So in the last few minutes, I want to kind of talk about the the mood and the state of the legislature right now. Uh, It may seem like a million years ago, but 2015 was probably one of the most tumultuous years in recent legislative history. You had a Speaker of the House have to resign after it was revealed he was exchanging sexually charged texts with an intern. One of your Democratic colleagues, Paul Lavota, had to resign after he was accused of sexual harassment. You were actually one of the first Democrats to speak up and say that if the accusations were true, he had to resign, which I'm sure was a difficult decision for you. And and again, the text messages were the things that kind of did him in. So I want to just ask, now that you have new leaders, now that some of the there's been a lot of talk about changing the tone for women in the legislature has kind of been talked about. Where is the legislature right now, in your view? Well, it's interesting. You know, we haven't heard much around uh, those kinds of issues, except for some of the bills that are being filed. And, you know, we have over 45, I think, right now, um, different kinds of ethics bills, very few of which deal with the idea of um, inappropriate behavior towards some of the young people who spend their time coming to learn from us and work in the Capitol. Um, I'm not sure that there's a good legislative way to deal with you know, bad moral behavior. But um, uh, I will say the tone is very different in Jefferson City. I think everybody, you know, certainly all of my interns from the very beginning have gone through their sexual harassment training. Um, And we're very much aware of that and want to make sure that people know that they can and should come to uh, the person for whom they work if there's ever a problem. But the the legislature itself is very different in terms that in these terms. This year, interestingly, in an election year where people say nothing ever gets done, it may be true at the end of the day that very little gets done. But I will tell you that bills in the Senate and bills in the House are moving at a, a speed I have never seen uh, in the past. So why? I think from the Senate side, and that's where I'm going to speak from. You know, Ron Richard t- calls himself some a man of uh, actions and few words. And, and that is exactly who he has proven himself to be. It seems to me that he has given word to the chairs of his committees that they need to be moving bills um, at, at a rapid rate, that he wants to see some things happen. He doesn't want a lot of chatter about these things. He just wants things to move to move through so that he can say that, you know, we spent our time well, that something was done. Um, I think we're going to get to spring break, and we're probably going to have heard and moved more bills to the floor than maybe in previous legislative sessions. Now, Richard had told me a few weeks ago there are a couple things. Number one, that um, he thought there was going to be a serious push to try to strip uh, Planned Parenthood funding from the federal portion of the Medicaid program. Just so our listeners know, Medicaid is partially, mostly funded by the federal government, partly by the state. The Planned Parenthood portion for family planning actually comes from the federal portion, not from the state portion, which was... Basically, any spending for that was stripped out 15 years ago uh, when the state got rid of its own family planning program in the late 90s. Now, um, even though other states have ended up in lawsuits uh, over this issue, um, Missouri Right to Life and other anti-abortion groups are really pushing this. And Richard said he expects there is going to be a big fight about that. And then in addition, 
you've got yet another effort to try to expand Medicaid. This is the last year that that the state would get any sort of so-called free money from the federal government to cover all the expansion costs unless there's unless there's a change. I mean, aside from the federal government would pay up to at least 90 percent in future years. But my point is this was the last year of the 100 percent funding. Right. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what you're hearing, what what you guys think is going to be happening, especially if other bills are being fast tracked. Well, let me just say that uh, Ron Richards right. If he tries to move that legislation forward to take away funding for Medicaid patients uh, to access health care through Planned Parenthood, there will be a fight. Um, There are some abortion bills, many of which came out of this Sanctity of Life Committee and these what we know to be falsely edited severely edited videos that show Planned Parenthood in a horrific light, show Planned Parenthood uh, essentially breaking the law. We know that those are not true. They have been proven not to be true. In the state of Texas, uh, the people who produced those videos are now indicted, even though they were trying to take Planned Parenthood to court. That was turned on its heels. And the people who produced the the anti-Planned Parenthood videos are being indicted for falsely putting out information. Um, In Missouri... The, the people who utilize their Medicaid, remember, these are people, working people who, a family of four that makes less than $5,000 a year, they need inexpensive access to health care to all those reproductive choices. Let's remember that Planned Parenthood, over 90% of what Planned Parenthood does is provide services other than abortion services. So we're going to take away low-income people's access to important health care if we continue to work to defund even the federal level of of money that's coming in for Planned Parenthood. Ron Richard is going to have a fight on his hands uh, if we move in that direction. Why we want to take away family planning, um, access to testing for um, sexually transmitted infections, access to birth control, access to... um, information about whether you should pursue a mammogram, all of those important health care issues that low-income inf- families access through, men and women, by the way, access through Planned Parenthood, I think is an unconscionable move on our part. Where are these people going to go that need to to get inexpensive, quality, reproductive health care? Now, on Medicaid, though, are you at all optimistic that any expansion will happen this year, or is that issue dead in the water at this point? I don't see – it's unfortunate, but I don't see it happening in a uh, in an, a, an election year. Um, we are very hopeful that people are getting around the state and, and delivering the message to people outside of the urban areas of the state, outside of the major cities of St. Louis and, and Kansas City, and letting people in more rural areas understand how expansion of Medicaid, providing – access to health care for an additional 330,000 individuals is going to help not only the hospitals in their district, but help so many of them um, be able to get health care. So, yeah. And then we hope next year maybe we'll be able to move this forward. My final question for you, going back to kind of the tone of legislature, obviously there's a, there's a heightened interest among the culture of Jefferson City this year after the events of last year. But do you think that people who are in the legislature now that are going to be here in 2017, 18, 19, 20. Do you think they'll heed the lessons that should have been learned after Deal and Lavota resigned? Or do you think that we're going to be hearing about similar scandals like this in the future? Well, unfortunately, no matter where you go, there are always some bad apples who take advantage of their position. And when we're put in positions of power, sometimes we forget that we are always accountable to the people. And so uh, I'd like to think that the better side of our nature takes over. That's simply not always going to be the case. I um, am sad to say it may it may very well happen again. I don't know how long those lessons will be heated. We will have to we'll have to actually see if those lessons are heated. But that's for another show. Thank you as always for joining us. We'll have to have you back for a third and a half time because, as the running gag is, people who have come on for the fourth time have to resign in disgrace. <laughs> we will uh, be back soon. Uh, you can read all of our stories at stlpublicradio.org. I'm on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. Joe is on Twitter at... Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And you are on Twitter at... At Jill Shoup. That's J-I-L-L-S-C-H-U-P-P. Very good. We'll be back next time. Until then, so long. <laughs>